If you have your Bible with me, let's turn to two passages of Scripture. Turn with me to James chapter 1, James chapter 1, and then once you find your place there, if you'll find your place or put a marker at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, all right? So James 1, we're going to spend a good portion of our time in James chapter 1, and then we're going to move over to 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, In a series of messages right now, we're talking about practicing His presence. It is about the presence of the Lord. God wants us to practice His presence. And so, and I don't know how you're doing, but I'm hoping that by now you are instituting the things of the Lord's Prayer into your life and you're praying these things. And again, we are learning the Lord's Prayer together, but I'm not, I'm not asking you, and I want to say this every week so we're real clear, because sometimes we get into the ritualistic worship of God, and God's not really interested in that. And so here's what we'll do. We'll actually uh, say the Lord's Prayer as a part of a ritual and uh, not say the Lord's and not realize that God's not asking you to say the Lord's Prayer to Him. He's saying that when you pray, pray in this manner or pray in this fashion or pray in this pattern. And uh, we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer tonight, but I'm also at the end of the message, I'm going to look at another prayer that Jesus prayed. And you may remember, uh, right before Jesus went to the cross, he went to the garden. And you remember what garden it was called? The Garden of Gethsemane. Remember that? And he prayed. Many people do not realize that the prayer he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he went to the cross is actually recorded for us. And uh, so a lot of times what we think is he went to pray, his disciples didn't, he came to his disciples, he told his disciples, couldn't you just pray with me for an hour, couldn't you just re- maintain, and we, re- and we think that the prayer was very short, but actually the Bible records an entire chapter on just the prayer, and I want to show it to you tonight. And so uh, this prayer that we're talking about tonight, the first one, we call it the Lord's Prayer. Uh, many people actually refer to what we call the Lord's Prayer. A lot of theologians refer to it more as the model prayer, not the Lord's Prayer. And that what we're going to see at the end, the prayer he prayed in the garden, is often referred to as the Lord's Prayer. So sometimes we get that backwards. But, and even in your scripture, sometimes they write the little headings above that. That was added to scripture later on. They refer to this as the Lord's Prayer. But actually, most theologians refer to it as the model prayer. In other words, the pattern prayer or the prayer that when you pray, pray like this, in this manner. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're going to look at those things tonight. So we're practicing His presence. And we are memorizing the Lord's Prayer. And so I want us to say the Lord's Prayer together, and every week I'm taking a little off now of the prayer, and uh, hopefully I'll get it. So anyway, last week I messed up in like two different services. I could not even think my words. I've been saying, I say it more than all of you. I study it more than all of you. And, and yet still messed it up, all right? So let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Let's say it loudly together, all right? And we're going to give you the first two words of each little verse until we get to verse 13. Then I'll give you the whole verse 13, okay? So starting in verse 9, you ready? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And so we have looked at each of those little things. I just want to bring out real quick, uh, this week we're looking at verse 13, and it says, the fir- and just the first part, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now I just want to bring out a couple of things before I get into the message, but I want you to notice the very first word of that. What's the very first word? And. That's not hard. I mean, some of you are like, can't be that easy. It must be something else. Or, no, And. <laughs> And the reason I want to bring that up is you may remember that when we looked at verse 12 last week uh, uh, that says, and, and, for, and forgive us, I had to go through it in my head, and forgive us our debts. No, isn't it interesting? Verse 12 also starts with the word and. And if you remember from last week's message, I talked about the reason it's saying and is it's a conjunction that joins it to the previous thought. So here's what I think. Here's what I personally, again, we talk about uh, forgive us our debts. And the, for, the previous verse says, and give us this day, our daily bread. And here's what I'm saying. I think God is saying, and daily pray, uh, forgive us our debts. 
And then I think he's also, when he says, and lead us, not in temptation, that's also a daily prayer. And daily, and joining it to the previous thought. And the funny thing is, when he says, give us this day our daily bread, he doesn't use the word and. So I think that it joins it to that verse. Does that make sense? So daily we should pray, Lord, uh, keep, uh, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Okay, I want to point out those things. Now, again, let me show you one more thing uh, here, uh, and then we'll get right into the message. Notice the word evil. And he says, and deliver us from evil. If you look at other translations of Scripture, what you'll actually discover is, and deliver us from and this is probably more accurate in translation, and deliver us from the evil one, <laughs> okay? I want you to catch that, because if you don't realize this, there is evil that is in this world. There is evil that is in this world, and again, uh, we, it, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against, uh, but, against, but against powers and principalities. So I know, first thing, as soon as I say, you know, uh, the evil one, some of you are going, yeah, my spouse. No, that's not who we're talking about, all right? Not talking about your husband, not talking about your wife, uh, my, you know, my coworker, they're the evil one. No, we're talking about uh, demonic forces. And it's interesting to me. Here's, I want you to catch this. It's really interesting. Uh, people who are in the world, and I'm talking about unbelievers, most unbelievers believe in demonic forces. I just think it's interesting. And here's what's funny is many believers don't believe in demonic forces. Well, I just, I just don't think that there's really any kind of evil in this world. Okay, let me just, it's interesting to me, Satan's a liar, and he's telling, he's telling the world, I exist, and I'm the right one to serve, and he's telling us, I don't exist, I don't exist. Now, why would Satan not want believers to know that he exists? Could it be that he knows that if we won't acknowledge him, that he'll still have some power and strength in our life? Okay, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm telling you there's an evil world and I'm talking about there's an evil one who's in the world who's prompting all of this. We need to catch that. And so I want to just make this first little statement. And lead us not into temptation. For many, many years, I, I did not understand lead us not into temptation. Why would God lead us into temptation? And that seems like a, it's almost a tough thing to think about. So I want to give you four things about this uh, message tonight. And I'm going to give them to you all four up front, uh, except I'm going to leave a blank in it, all right? So I'm going to give you all four of my points up front, and then, because I, I think it might help us as we look at the rest of it tonight. So let me give you all four points, and I'm going to leave a blank, all right? So number one, God can't, and then just write a blank, okay? So number one, first thing I'm going to talk about is God can't. The, the second thing I'm going to talk about is God won't, all right? And here's the third thing, uh, God will, and here's the last thing, if we will. All right, did you catch that? So these are the four things I want to talk about tonight. Uh, God can't, God won't, God will, and then the last one is if we will. And then we're going to talk about those things, and I'll, I have a blank to fill in after each of those, all right? So let's start with the first one. God can't tempt us. I want to, again, remember that little statement, and lead us not into temptation. Okay, uh, so just so you know, God is not the one who tempts. But the question is, can God lead us into temptation? And so I want to just look at those things tonight. Again, uh, and I know the first thing we're going to think about is, well, uh, I'm not saying that God can tempt, but can God actually tempt, can God allow us to be led into temptation? And the answer to that is, yes, he can. We're going to look at that, right? So first of all, God can't tempt us. God can't tempt us. There's several things in the Bible that God can't do, all right? Let me give you one of them, all right? God can't change. Did you get that? God can't change. Okay, uh, by the way, God can't have a new thought. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, there's a lot of things that we know about God. God can't have a new thought because uh, if he did, he wouldn't know everything, right? And God can't change. He has to be the same. The Bible tells us very clearly he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, let me give you another one, and this, this one ought to be a great blessing to you, uh, and I'm going to use a double negative to get this, all right? So, God can't not love you. Did you catch that? I know I'm using a double negative, but it, I think it's uh, pretty good English, <laughs> all right, or, or pretty good theology. Bad English, good, good theology. God can't not love you. Are, are you catching that? In other words, 
God loves you. God cares about you. And so there are several things that God can't do, all right? Again, someone says, well, what about him being all-powerful? Well, he is all-powerful, but I'm telling you that he has already lined out how things are going to happen, so therefore he can't change that. He's going, to say, it's going to, he's going to stay the same. So God can't tempt us. Turn over to James chapter 1 real quick. James chapter 1, and look down to verse 12. We're going to start in verse 12, but eventually we're going to go back uh, to the beginning of this chapter. But notice verse 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. And I want you just to notice that word, uh, trial. It's a very important word. We're going to look at it again. He says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial trial. By the way, that word trial, let me just go ahead and say it, get it out of the way. That word trial is the same word as the word that we find uh, in Matthew 6, 13, and lead us not into temptation. Okay, watch this. Blesses the man who perseveres under temptation. That's really what he's saying. Blesses the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, by the way, it's, it's understood that you will be tempted. When he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. In other words, he says, don't, don't let anyone ever say, it's God who is tempting me. Why? For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Let me, again, let me make my point. God can't tempt us. It is impossible for God to tempt us. And let me just say, so if you don't understand this, uh, God is not the tempter. Satan is the tempter. Are you following that? So he says, uh, he says uh, and he himself does not tempt anyone, verse 14. But each one, and this is very important to understand, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Okay, I want you just to notice this. I want you to see where does temptation come from? Well, obviously, the enemy, Satan, is the great tempter. But I, do you notice that some things that took place in order for what James is talking about, that temptation can enter in? Notice this very last verse, verse 14. Uh, but each one is tempted when? When? When does it happen? When he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And by the way, depending on what version you're looking at, uh, one version says carried away by his own desires. Think about the word carry for just a minute, all right? Do you realize that God is not interesting, rest, interested in you carrying your own burden? I want you to think about this. And by the way, the word carry here is the same word where God talks about that we should not carry our burdens, but that we should carry his yoke. The Bible tells us very clearly we should carry his yoke for. He says, my yoke is light and it is easy. Okay, I want you to think about burdens for just a moment, talking about carrying, and he says you're carried away by your own desires. Do you know what happens in our own life? You know where temptation comes from? When we have stress and worry. Anyone ever had stress and worry in your life? And here's what we do. Uh, stress and worry becomes like a giant burden that we carry around. And here's what God is saying. Why are you worried about tomorrow? Uh, give me your worries. Let me carry them. And, and if you want to read this, Matthew chapter 11 is very clear about this. And he says, for I'm, what I'm wanting for you is that you would take my yoke and that you would take my burden for they are light and they're easy. Are, are you following this? Okay, let me tell you what happens. Here's where temptation comes in. Temptation comes in when we have a burden, when we have a stress, when we have a difficulty, something that we're facing, and then we're carried about by our own desires. What we think will fix it. Anyone ever felt like you need to fix it? Any men in the room feel like a fix it? <laughs> okay, and here's what he said. Uh, let me read it again so you catch this. Each one is tempted when? Are you following that? Okay, let me tell you how temptation works. When we're not trusting the Lord with all of our burdens, the enemy has opportunity to come and tempt us. Are you following that? Okay, uh, how important is it then that daily we lay our burdens down? 
Are, are you following that? I mean daily. And by the way, if you're like me, I'm, I'm not saying I'm perfect to this. I, I am far from perfect from this. But I, and let me tell you, I, I, I know how you are because I know how I am. Uh, there are many, many times where I have a burden and I have a stress and I have something that I'm worried about and I'll tell the Lord, Lord, I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you. And all night long, I carry the burden. Anyone ever done that? Anyone ever done that? Okay. And I mean, the next day I get up and the first thought on my head is, well, uh, I, I laid that burden down. I need to pick it up and I need to fix it today. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we are carried away by our own desires. What we think will fix it. Are, are you following that? So I want, you, I want you to understand something. We need to learn to rest. We need to learn to rest. Listen to me. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to think if I'm getting ahead of myself. Probably am. Uh, well, who cares? Anyway, <laughs> just going to go with it. Do you realize that one of the reasons we're tempted is because we are not doing what we were created to do? Okay, think, I, want you, I want you to hear me about some things, all right? Uh, if you're a husband, you were created to be a husband. I'm going to ask you a question. How are you doing, guys, at being a husband? Uh, and I'm telling you that when we get being a husband out of alignment with what God is saying, then we have an opportunity for temptation to come into our life. Uh, we, have, we, we, we have been created to be fathers or mothers. When we get those things out of whack, uh, we have an opportunity to be led away by our own desires. Okay, I'm, I'm going to use two big ones, all right? Work. I want you to hear me. Uh, guys, ladies, God created us to work. P please hear me. I'm telling you, one, one of the areas where I find that people are led away by temptation is when they will not work. We live in a society today that is a tempted society because we have a lot of people who will not work. I'm saying to you, you need to understand, you were created to learn to work. And again, I'm going to give you one more that maybe you've never thought of before. You were created to rest. I want you to hear this very clearly, and I'm telling you because I think that we get the burden, we begin to pick up burdens because we won't rest. Now, let, I want to say it so you get this. If you're not working and you're resting all the time, you're missing it. But I'm saying to you as well, if you're working all the time and you're not resting, uh, you're missing it. Because God created us to also rest. Let me, let me change the word just a little bit from rest, all right? God created you to recreate. Okay, you know, let me, let me, you know what recreation is? Anyone know what recreation is? Okay, to have fun. God wants you to have fun. Okay, listen, he does want you to work, but he also put them in a garden where there could be pleasure and to have fun. Are you following this? Okay, listen, I, I want you to catch this. Do you know what the root of the word recreate is? To recreate. I'm, I'm telling you how important rest is to the believer. I'm saying to you that God made you to work, but he also made you that you need to recreate and to renew your mind every day. Every day. And I'm saying to you that if we don't learn how to lay our burdens down and come home from work and learn how to have fun, we're going to miss God. I'm saying to you we need to learn how to rest. And, and that means, I want, I want to say very clearly, I actually, uh, God's been really dealing with me on this subject for some time now. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you my heart, okay? Uh, for years now, uh, I have uh, worked very hard uh, here at the church, very hard. Uh, but God began to, a couple of years ago, lay on my heart about that I was not resting. I was not resting. And so I, began to, I've, I have begun to change my structure uh, so I'm just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it so that you hear it, all right? So most people think that I should be in the platform every single weekend, okay? Uh, up until two years ago, I was in the platform about 48 weekends uh, per year out of 52, 48 out of 52 a year. Uh, last year, I made the choice. I decided I'm not going to be in the platform that often. I'm going to be, I'm only going to be in the, this church platform 40 weekends a year, okay? Now, I want, I want to just say, so you understand, you, you may not catch this. Uh, last year, I preached 175 times last year. 
uh, that here's what they say. They say that one 30-minute message, and I don't know where they come up with this number, but that's what I'm told. One 30-minute message is equal to eight hours of work. Uh, people don't understand. When I leave, uh, unless you've ever done this, and I've had several of our guys in our church preach from here, and they'll tell you it's true, uh, you leave after a weekend, and you are literally absolutely totally exhausted. I mean completely exhausted. Well, the Lord began to convict me about that. You know, you are not taking rest. How can I bless you if you don't learn how to recreate, how to rest from, what, from the work that I've given you? So I'm saying to you guys, if I have a problem in that area, and I, I'm a pastor here, I'm saying to you, if I have a problem with that, probably some of you have a problem with that too. And so this year, I'm, I've just made the choice. I'm not going to preach more. Than, I'm not going to be in the platform more than 40 weekends. And I'm also trying to teach myself, reteach myself how to go have fun. Does that make sense? I'm saying to you, you need to have fun too. Now listen, if, you're, if all you're doing is sitting at home playing PlayStation all the time, you probably need to learn to play to go to work. All right? Just saying. All right? Because you also are going to be carried away in the wrong way as well. You're going to be tempted. I know a lot of people won't work, and they're carried away by temptation. But I want to just kind of talk about we live in a work, work, work society where uh, we're expected to work 50, 60, 70 hours a week. And uh, we actually have a policy here at the church that everyone must work a minimum of 40 but no more than 50, and not be away from home more than three nights a week. I'm saying some of you probably ought to put some of those stipulations in your own life. Amen? Amen. Okay, again, I believe in work, but I'm telling you, sometimes I think we've gone way off the edge, and we're working too much, and we're not learning how to recreate and spend time with our kids and our family and our wives and, and enjoy life. Is that good? Yeah. So, that, that was really off point, but that's all right. We'll jump anyway. So uh, I may add it later. All right, so uh, let me just show you some verses. Matthew chapter 4. I want, I want you to watch this. Really cool. Uh, Matthew 4, the Bible says when Jesus, remember Jesus went out into the wilderness. Remember that? And he fasted for 40 days, and we're in a fast right now. Verse 3 says, and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, uh, command that these stones become bread. Okay, who came to him? Who came to him? The tempter, right? That's who it is. And then I want to show you one more verse. 1 Thessalonians 3, 5 says, For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith. For fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. Okay, listen to me. There is a tempter, and what the tempter does is tempt people. Okay, so God can't tempt us. That's what the tempter does. Here's number two. God won't mislead us. God won't mislead us. Now, again, if you're there in James, look at, uh, we're, we're talking about trials. We're talking about temptation. Uh, stay in James 1. Look up to verse 2. Look at verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various, there's that word again, trials. Count it joy when you face, let me, let me, let me change it so that you can get what he's saying. Uh, count it a joy when you when you face temptation. Now, uh, I'm, I'm, let me just say so you understand. He's not saying enter into the joy of temptation. That's not what he's saying, all right? Because I'm afraid someone's going to walk away and say, the pastor said I should enjoy temptation. That's not what I'm saying, all right? He's saying consider it all joy, brothers, when you get the opportunity to have to face temptation because we are going to, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Okay, here's, here's what I want you to get. Uh, God can't tempt us, but God won't mislead us. In other words, I, I want you to understand, uh, God will lead you and God will lead you into temptation. Okay, it's a different, again, I want you to hear me. I'm not saying that God tempts us. I'm saying God will allow you to be led into temptation. Why would God do that? Because he knows that when you learn how to endure this, he can change your life. I'm saying to you, God will bring temptation in your life. He's not the tempter. He's not the one who's going to do it, but he'll allow it knowing that it'll perfect your faith. That's what he says right here. Verse 4, and let endurance have its perfect results. In other words, endure temptation. 
You're going to have, listen, so you understand, God's not saying, don't, don't ever, not, God's not saying when we pray, uh, Lord, please don't ever let any temptation whatsoever to come into my life. Here's what he's saying, when you lead us in, help us out. And by the way, the answer to being into temptation every time is, Lord, I know I'm going to be facing temptation, but when I do, will you help me? Will you help me to walk back out of it? So uh, he says, uh, very clearly, and let, us, and let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Okay, I'm, I want to show you a verse that maybe you've never seen before. Watch this. And I know we probably read it, but maybe you've never seen it this way. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 says this. Then Jesus was led, I want you to catch this, by the Spirit who led Jesus. Okay, where did he lead him? into the wilderness. Why did he lead him into the wilderness? To be tempted by the devil. Did anyone catch that? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say to you, God will not mislead you, but there is a reason that God will allow temptation to come into your life. He, he brought temptation into Jesus' life because he knew that in the end, it would produce something that only temptation can produce. And let me say it a different way. Only temptation, uh, when we endure it, and when we go through it on the other side, we're, we're better people. I'm saying to you, temptation is coming. And God will lead you into temptation. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But I want you to understand, it's not God who's tempting. He leads you into the courts of it so that he can strengthen you and you can come through it better on the other side. Okay, let me just show you something else. Let me show you another verse. Okay, it's talking about the same thing. Jesus being led in the wilderness by the Spirit uh, and uh, uh, and to be tempted by the devil. Okay, I'm going to read a parallel passage to that. Okay, so in Luke's gospel, he's also talking about Jesus being led into the wilderness. But after he's led into the wilderness, do you know what the Bible says about it? Okay, let me, let me read it for you. Luke 4, verse 14. And this is right after the temptation. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And then it says, and news spread about him all throughout the, all, the whole district. Okay. Is, okay, I want you to catch what he said. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, into dry places. Are y'all following that? To be tempted, but when he came through on the other side, the Bible says he was in the power of the Spirit. Are, are you following that? Listen, uh, God's not saying, uh, Lord, don't lead me into temptation. He's saying, Lord, when you lead me, make sure you're with me and help me to get out. Is that good? So lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He knows that temptation is coming. Temptation is coming. Uh, so uh, let me show you another verse real quick, all right? So Jesus, that's what happened in Jesus' life, but I, I love this part. Ro Hebrews 4, I always think it's funny how chapters have... Uh, you know, if you look in chapter 4, you'll see a lot of the same thing. So we looked at Matthew 4, we looked at Luke 4, Hebrews 4. Watch this. For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. In other words, he can sympathize with your weakness. Why? But one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Okay, he, Jesus has faced every temptation that you've ever faced. He already faced it. And therefore, he can sympathize with you. He understands what you're going through. Uh, he, Hebrews 2 verse 18 says, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Okay, let me tell you what these two verses tell us. Jesus understands the temptation you're facing in your life. And because he understands it and because he went through it, he's able to sympathize and he's able to help. He's able to bring aid. Okay, here's, here's what we do. Uh, we'll come to God, and we know we're facing temptation. Anyone know when you're facing temptation in your life, some temptation that jumps in? Okay, okay, let me just say, so you get this. Here's what the Bible says. He was tempted in all points. And here's what we'll do. You know, I don't want to tell God about my temptations. Uh, because if I tell him what I'm tempted with, he'll know I'm tempted. <laughs> okay, I got news for you. He already knows. <laughs> okay. And, but we will, we'll hide it from God. We think we're hiding it from God, but God already knows. Okay, let me tell you so you understand. This is real simple because when we talk about lead us not in temptation, listen, what we need to do is go to God and say, Lord, I'm tempted. This is a temptation in my life. I'm talking about if you're, if you're tempted with impure thoughts, 
You ought to just go to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I've, I don't know why. I don't understand it. I've got impure thoughts in my life. And here's what God says. I understand. You know, I was tempted with the very same thing. And, and then we could say, Lord, how did you face it? How did you get through it? How were you able to come through on the other side? And the Lord says, I can help you with that. Is that good news? I'm telling you, we have a helper in Jesus. We have a helper in the Holy Spirit. So let's not hide our temptation. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but when I am. Lord, I'm tempted. How did you get through it? I can sympathize with that, and I can help you. I can help you to walk through it. And if Jesus did it victorious and came out the other side in the power of the Spirit, isn't that what we want too? Isn't that what we want? We need to take our temptations to the Lord. And then I want to show you one more verse. Deuteronomy 8, verse 16 says, uh, talking about the children of Israel. Watch this. In the wilderness. Remember that little verse uh, that we just read a while ago? Talked about in the wilderness that G Jesus was led out on the wilderness. Think about the wilderness. In the wilderness, he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. Okay, why would God uh, allow temptation to come? Here's why. Because he knows that he can bring you through temptation and on the other side there's good. That's why the Bible says in Romans 8, says all things work together for good to those who love him. Okay, listen to me very clearly. I'm not saying that everything is good. That's not what that verse says. That verse doesn't say everything's good. It's saying that all things work together for good. I'm saying to you that when you have to face a temptation, God's taking you through it because he wants to change your life. He knows there's an area of weakness that's in your life. And if you'll go through the temptation, I'm not talking about succumbing to it. I'm talking about overcoming it. And if you'll go through the temptation, he knows on the other side there's something good for you. Now, let me tell you what happened to the children of Israel. Children of Israel went into temptation. They were in the wilderness. And, and here's what the Bible says. You can go and read it. The Bible says it was an 11-day journey from Egypt to the promised land. 11 days. And you know how long they stayed in the wilderness? 40 years. I wonder how many of us, God is leading us into the wilderness to be tempted. And we don't get through it for 40 years. Because we won't come back. To, and by the way, you know what the answer was? Uh, get this. Every day in the daytime, there was a pillar of cloud that people could look towards. And at night, there was a, there was a pillar of fire that people could look towards. Let me tell you the answer to every temptation. If we would just follow the pillar. If they would follow the cloud by day. If they had just followed the, night by, uh, the fire by night. Uh, they wouldn't have remained in the wilderness for 40 years. Lord, we don't understand this. Boy, it's hard what we're having to go through. It's a difficulty. It's a struggle. But no matter where you move, I'm going with you. I'm going to keep my eyes on you. And they would have been in the wilderness, out of the wilderness, and in the promised land in 11 days. I'm saying to you, listen to me very clearly, many, many believers stay in the wilderness for years when God is saying it's a short journey Come through it with me and let me be your help. Let me be your strength. Is that good? So lead us not into temptation. Lead us not. So uh, God can't uh, tempt us. God won't mislead us. Here's number three. God will deliver us. God will deliver us. Okay, I, I want you to just think about, uh, if I were to break down that little statement and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, let me tell you what it's talking about. Let me point it in two points, okay? Uh, lead us and deliver us. That's what he's talking about. Lord, lead us. I need your leadership in my life. And Lord, deliver me when the enemy comes. Does that, does that make it real clear? So what we're praying for is, Lord, I need your leadership. And Lord, I need your deliverance every day. Is that pretty clear? So watch this. God uh, will deliver us. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 10. We're going to look at one verse and I, but I think this may be the most important verse uh, outside of James that I think we're going to read tonight, all right? And I, so I want you to see two promises of God, all right? So watch this. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Watch this. No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. Okay, here's what he's saying. Uh, there is no temptation that's not common to man. And remember what Hebrews said, and he faced all temptation and he was able to overcome them without sin, okay? And he, therefore he can sympathize with us and aid us, okay? In other words, he, he can help us. So there's no, there's no temptation that you're facing. Here's what a lot of people think when they're facing temptation. I'm, I think I'm the only one who's ever had to do this. I feel like I'm the only one who's ever had to go through this, okay? I want you, that, that's a lie of the enemy. The enemy will say, you're the only one. And you know what? You're the only one who keeps failing, 
That's what the enemy will keep telling you. Here's what he's saying. It's common. It is common to man. He says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as common to man. And God is faithful. Is that great words? And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. That is a great promise of God. Uh, I'm telling you, the greatest promise that you can hear, here's what God's saying. I'm not going to allow a temptation to come into your life uh, that is beyond what you can endure. Here's what many of us do. We succumb, succumb to temptation that we could have made it through. Because God's Word says, no temptation has been given to you that you can't. You can do it. You can do it. You can get through it. Here's the second promise. But with the temptation, we'll provide the way of escape also. So you'll be able to endure it. Okay, get this. He says two things. First promise is uh, that God will not allow you to be tempted, tempted beyond what you can stand. Here's the second promise. And he's made a way of escape. Is that good? I'm telling you, no matter what you face in your life, there's a way. God has made a way so that you don't have to, you don't have to, you can escape it. You can escape it. God, thank you for the temptation counted all joy. Thank you for the temptation that's come in my life. And thank you that you provided a way to deliver me from it so that I don't have to face it. I can get it through it. I can handle this thing. I can go into the wilderness and be tempted. But I know that there's a path to get out. And here, let me tell you what the path is. If you don't know what the way of escape is, Jesus is your way of escape. I'm telling you, you need to look to him, the author and finisher of your faith. Amen? He's the way of escape. Uh, let, me, let me show you another verse. 2 Timothy 4, 17 says, But the Lord stood with me, and he strengthened me. Did you ca catch who stood with him? Did you catch who strengthened him? Who? The Lord. The Lord stood with me, and he strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. Is that deliverance? He said, I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. Who do you think did that? Because you think Paul was that good? Or do you think it was because God was that good? He was delivered out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely into his kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Anyone follow? Does that not sound like the passage we just read? Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Paul recognized that. Paul understood there will be temptation, but I can face it with the one, Jesus Christ, who's able to strengthen me. That's who Jesus is. Let me give you another verse. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Okay, I want you to get what he said. God knows how to rescue you. He has made a way of escape. Thank you, Lord. So listen, the next time you're facing temptation, Lord, I, I'm tempted. And here's what I'm tempted with. We ought to be honest about it. Here's what I'm tempted with. And the Lord says, yeah, I face that too. Well, can you help me? Absolutely. I would love to help you out of that. If you'll do this, if you'll walk through that door, if you'll go that direction, I'm telling you, I'll help you to get out of this thing. God loves to help his people to make a way of escape. Does that make sense? Everyone good with that? Okay, let me give you point four. Here's the last one. Uh, God will deliver us, and here's number four, if we will pray. I want to just remind you that this is a part of a prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, e from the evil one. This is a part of a prayer, if we'll pray. I think this is where a lot of Christians mess up. We're unwilling to pray. Let me just show you an Old Testament reference to this, all right? Watch this. Uh, Psalms 119, verse 133. Uh, Establish my footsteps in your word. Remember, I told you, what is the prayer? Two parts of the prayer. What is it? Uh, lead us and deliver us. Remember that? Okay, watch it. See if you see. Lead us and deliver us. Establish my footsteps in your word. Here's what he says. L Lord, lead me in your word. I'm telling you that God's word is a light to your path and a lamp to your feet. Is that right? Okay, listen, if that's the truth, I'm telling you, then we need to be in God's Word daily. Lord, today, I have the potential of being tempted. Will you help me? And then watch this. And do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Here's what he's saying. Lead me, 
lead my steps, and Lord, deliver me. Thank you, Lord. That's a great prayer to pray, isn't it? And then let me give you a couple more verses. Uh, and, and let me say, uh, you remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? And uh, he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, remember, he came back and he found his, his disciples doing what? Praying? Sleeping. Sleeping. All right? Okay, watch what Jesus says to them in the Garden of Gethsemane. All right? This is in Matthew 26, verse 41. Keep watching. Isn't it interesting what God says, what Jesus is telling his disciples that's important in prayer? Keep watching. And the inference is keep praying. Keep watching. And praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay, anyone ever felt like that? By the way, most of us are very uh, familiar with the passage that says, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. But do you know what he, he starts it off with saying? He says, keep watching and keep praying so that you won't be tempted. I'm saying to you, here's what he's saying, and daily, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil. And he's saying we need to keep on praying, keep on praying, keep watchful, keep watching, keep watching. Okay, that's what he came and told his disciples. Okay, what was the prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? Again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to give it to you. It's in, found in John chapter 17. That's, everything in John 17 is when they were in the garden and Jesus prays one final prayer and it's an entire chapter, all of John 17. He's in the garden. And I just want to pull out one little part of John 17, okay? Here's what Jesus was praying when he was in the garden. John 17, verse 15. I do not ask you to take them out of the world. Here, here's what Jesus was praying for you. I do not ask that you would take them out of the world. Okay, why? See, you know what he was asking? I'm asking that you'll lead them. He, he said, I, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, Lord, but I want you to lead them, but to keep them from the evil one. I want you to keep them from the evil one. See, I want to tell you so that you understand, there is evil in this world, and it has a design. The design of the evil one is to kill you, to steal from you, and to destroy you. I want you to get that. It is, it is happening all the time. Uh, I got asked uh, one time, about uh, church. Uh, I was being asked by another pastor one time uh, who was, he was getting ready to enter into the ministry and he asked me, he said, uh, what is it? And it's been since I started this church. And so uh, he said, what, what do you find is the most difficult thing about ministry? And I thought about it for a while and I finally I came back and this is what I told him. I said, I did not realize uh, the level of uh, spiritual warfare that you have to face. I did not realize how the enemy wanted to destroy me so badly. I, I think that's, if you want, if I want to, I'm going to tell you the greatest mistake I ever made was I underestimated the enemy for so many years. I really didn't think he was powerful enough to kill me or to destroy me. But I'm telling you, uh, since we started this, uh, I, it's like you, you begin to see things over time and you go, wow, uh, that was a great opportunity for the enemy to take me out right there. Uh, and, and how important it is to spend time in prayer. Uh, let me, I'm just going to throw a few things at you. It's really interesting since we started this church. Uh, you know, again, I'm saying to you, sometimes we do things that are stupid, that puts us in a bad situation. But on the other hand, I want you to understand there's a lion who's not the lion of the tribe of Judah, but the Bible says that, that Satan's like a roaring lion. He's trying to destroy us all the time. Uh, right after we first started this church, about a couple of years in, uh, I'll never forget, I was actually driving a four-wheeler, a ranger, and I'm, I go around a corner, long story is a lot into it, but I rolled the ranger uh, onto myself. The roll bar hit me in some way. I'm not sure exactly how. Uh, broke seven ribs and lacerated a kidney. Spent a couple of nights in the hospital, and that was way too long. I just want you to know. But I got to thinking, you know, that, the enemy could have taken me out. And I remember after that ranger rolled over on me, it was upside down, and I was in the, the heat, in the sunshine, in the middle of the summer, and I remember thinking, I got to get out of the heat first thing I need to crawl so I crawled got up underneath that ranger where there was some shade and I remember thinking Lord is this it because I'm I, mean, I was hurting I thought is this it and I remember the Lord saying to me I'm not finished I'm not finished with you I've still got you uh I, I, the, the last summer uh, and we have, I could probably name a bunch of different times last summer I was driving my car going home came around a corner when I got around that corner there was a truck that was in my lane coming head on with me with no place for me to go. 
And I'm just telling you, uh, I'm, you, you can look at it any way you want, but I'm telling you, the enemy would like to take me out. I'm just telling you, the enemy would like to take me out. Now, I'm telling you, there is a sign post and then a series of mailboxes and a little teeny tiny window. I've, I've looked at it two or three times going by it. And every time I look at it, I think, how in the world did I squeeze my car through there? I squeezed it through, went into the dirt, came back out the other side, and was able to squeeze through more mailboxes and another post and get right back on the road and not a scratch. Uh, I'm telling you, the enemy has a design to try and kill you. Uh, but uh, I'll give you another one. Uh, several years ago, while Anna was still in high school, uh, we had a little Mazda 626, and she was driving it. Uh, she was going to school one morning, and her phone slid off the seat. She reached down to get it, took her eyes off the road, uh, ran off into a culvert, flipped the car end over end, landed it back into the middle of the road, and got out and walked away. Okay, I, I want to say to you, and I remember thinking when I pulled up, my first thought was, I don't care about the car. My first thought was, is she okay? I'm saying to you, Satan has a design to try and destroy you. And God's leading you. My question to you is, are you looking to the one who's leading you? Are you looking to him? I'm saying, are you trusting him with your daily life, your daily walk? I'm telling you, the enemy wants to kill you. If you don't get this, I'm, please, please do not walk home and go, the pastor said that God wants to kill preachers. Yes, he does. <laughs> but he also wants to kill you. You're a believer. My question to you is, are you going to him daily and saying, Lord, help me? Help me today. Keep me safe. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've had to go right through the belly of it, through the, through the lion's mouth, and you came out the other side and God delivered you. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Well, why wouldn't we want to go to him every day and pray? I'm saying to you, prayer is so important. I, I've had this thought several times. Uh, I know uh, some of you pray for me a lot. But I know there's one person who prays for me all the time, my mom. And I, I had this thought one time, uh, what will I do when the Lord decides to take my mom home? Will there be someone who's praying for me? I, I'm saying to you, do you have people who will pray for you? I'm, I, I'm telling you, we need accountability. We need to find other people who are believers and go to them and say, uh, will you pray for me? And I'm not talking about superficially will you pray for me every day and i'm going to pray for you every day there's power in prayer and god's saying will you pray